good morning everyone are you able to hear me hello yeah good morning everyone today i am going to continue with your same chapter that is chapter number 2 that we have started in the last class in the yesterday's class that is digital image fundamental that is what are the various yeah what are the various basic operations basic concept that is behind the digital image and this one code that is available over here those who wish to succeed must ask the right questions that means who wants to succeed in the life that that must ask the right questions all right uh, now let's start again so we have started with the chapter number 2 in the last class and we have yeah we have talked about sub concept some topics about this one first one is a preview that is what is the main main content with them it is the main crux of this chapter why we are going to study the fundamentals of the digital images what is the use of this then elements of the visual perception that means what are the various element that is presented in the that is available in the visual perception that means how we are dealing with the visual perception what is the mathematical and the probabilistic formulation that is the human intuition and the analysis that plays a central role in the choice of one technique versus another and that is how to or how how often we are used on the subjective visual judgment hence developing a basic understanding of the human visual perception is the first step in our journey that is a, a, one of the main step in the visual perception that is available in the basic understanding of the human visual perception and when we talk about the complexity and the breadth we are talking about or we are talking about the various aspect of the human vision that is uh, one is interested in the mechanics and the parameter related to how images are formed and perceived by the therefore factors such as the how human and the electronic image devices compare in terms of the resolution what is the resolution of the image and how how we are going to take that image that we have discussed next one is the structure of the human eye that we have, we have discussed there are two parts one is the cornea one is the sclera that is outer cover that is known as the choroid retina and that that choroid is the or cornea is a tough transparent tissue that covers a whole range and this is the diagram that you studied that is simplified diagram of a cross section of the human eye There is a cornea, there is a ciliary, there is a iris, that is the anterior chamber, uh, that is available within the anterior chamber. Then there is a lens, there is a lexus, then uh, fovea, that is also we can say the internal boundary, inner boundary that is used. Then blind spot, retina. And for the outer part, there is a nerve and the sheath that is that is used in the um, in the section of the human eye. Yes, when we talk about the choroid, that is just below the sclera. So the first one or layer is the sclera, then second one layer is the choroid. That is just below. That is directly below the sclera. Now, when we talk about the lens, that is the that is made up of the concentric layers of the fibrous cells and is suspended by the fiber that is attached to the ciliary body, and that contains 60 to 70 percent water that is uh, or that is available with the alum. Six percent fat and more proteins than any other tissues in the eye. And the innermost membrane of the cell is known as the retina, that lies within or inside the walls of the or inside of the or that lines the inside of the walls entire posterior portion. Then uh, next is the blind spot that is available. There are two parts. One is the left side is the degrees that is the degree from the visual axis, and on the right side there is also the Degrees and there are two parts that we have studied. One is the cones, one is the roots, and that is used in the fovea also. That is the degree of axis that is measured by the angle formed by the visual axis and the line passing through the center of the lens and intersecting the retina. Then, fovea itself is a circular indentation in the retina of about 1.5 mm in the diameter. That means its thickness is 1.5 mm in the diameter and in terms of the future discussions talking about the square or the rectangular array of sensing elements is most useful is more we can say the getting the retina concepts and therefore by taking the some liberty in the interpretation we can view the fovea as a square sensor array of the size 1.5 into 1.5 and the density of the cones in that area of retina is approximately 15000 sorry 150000 that is the 1.5 lakhs elements per mm. that is based on the ccd that is a charge double or coupled device 
yeah ccd is a device that is used for the that is used for the resolutions we can say and this this is the minimum resolution that is available that is 5 into 5 m the next we have studied about the how to how to create the image formation or how the image will be formed in the eye so when we talk about the ordinary photographic camera the lens has a fixed length and the focusing at various distances that is covered or that is achieved by varying the distance between the lens and the imaging plane so whatever the distance that is available that that the distance between the lens and the imaging plane where the film is located and this is opposite to the human eye that mean converse is also true that the difference between the lens and the imaging uh, region is fixed and the focal length is achieved obtained by varying the shape of the lens this is one of the diagram this is one of the concept that we have studied this is the 15 meter height tree that is rotated that is a uh, uh, that is seen from the eye for, with the point c that is point c is the optical center of the lens and that optical center ranges with of the 17 mm and the, the total range is 100 meter from the eye to the tree so distance between the center and the retina is approximately 17 mm and the range is approximately 14 to 17 mm and the total range that is between distance we can say that is 100 meter as per this example the next one that we have already talked about the brightness adaptation and the discrimination no we have not finished the discrimination that i'm going to start in the today's class what is the meaning of the discrimination so when we talk about the brightness because digital images are displayed at a discrete uh, set of the intensity there are some um, we can say resolutions of the images so the eye's ability to discriminate between different intensity level is one of the important consideration in presenting the image processing result that is what is the main result that is used for the brightness or we can say what is the main result that is used with the intensity level there are multiple intensity level that is an important consideration in presenting the image processing results in that case also the range of the light intensity levels to which the human visual system can adapt is enormous that is an on the order of the 10 by 10 from the scotopic threshold to the glare limit that is the range of the uh, light intensity level to which the human visual system can adapt in the enormous way the experimental evidence also indicates that subjective brightness is perceived or that is done by the human visual system that is the logarithmic function of the light intensity incidence on the eye that is experimental approach incidence or evidence that indicates the selective brightness what is the mean brightness in the human visual system that is the log term of the light intensity incidence on the eye. Now this figure that shows what is the glare point, how how it works, and the range of the subjective brightness sensation that is showing a particular adaptation level. This is a 2.4 figure that is uploaded that that uh, works of the light intensity versus the subjective brightness. This is the adaptation range. This is the scotopic and this is the photopic. And this is the subjective brightness and this is the scotopic threshold. There is the threshold, adaptation range, photopic, and the scotopic. and the transition we can say the range from the scotopic to the photopic is gradually decrease over the approximate range from 0.011 to the 0.1 only mm the main reason is that the distance between them is increased but the main important point is that when we talk about the dynamic range when we talk about the visual system that can operate over such a range simultaneously it accomplish a large variation or it it is done by the large variation we can say it is it is used with the large variations with the overall sensitivity that phenomenon is known as a brightness adaptation that means a picture would be clear there is a proper visual system that can operate and that can operate on a range on a simultaneously basis that is known as a brightness adaptation a total range of a discrete intensity level the eye can discriminate that means i can handle 
simultaneously rather than when the computer are compared with the total adaptation range. And with the given set of conditions, that brightness adaptation level is also correspond or also used within the within the term that is available or that is used within the brightness adaptation level that is denoted by the BA in the figure 2.4. When you talk about the figure 2.4, this is the brightness. Now, if, if I'm talking about the level of the changes, if I'm talking about the restricted level, that is the level BB at and below, which all stimuli are perceived as a different blacks or different blobs. The ability of I to discriminate between the changes in the light intensity at any specific adaptation level is also of the considerable interest. So when you talk about the changes in the light in intensity that is used to the specific adaptation level, that is also of the considerable interest. And there is experiment to determine the capability of the human eye for brightness of having the subject look at the flat when, he, when it is available in the sunlight, when it is available in the normal light, that is the tube light. In case, in this case, we are using the delta i. So there are two terms. One is the i, one is the delta i. Delta i means whatever the changes, whatever the um, new enhancement, whatever the changes that is available within the image that is denoted by the delta i. That is not bright enough. The subject says no, indicating the no perceivable change. And when, when the delta i gets stronger, that means the changes get stronger, the subject may give a positive response of the eye. So response is no in first case because delta i is not bright enough. But when we talk about the delta i that gets stronger, the subject may give a positive response of yes, indicating a perceived change. Finally, when delta i is strong enough and the subject gives a response of yes all the times, the total quantity that is the delta i c divided by delta i is increment of the illumination discriminable 50% of the time that is the background illumination i. That ratio means the distance between the I and the delta I ratio is known as a Weber ratio. And this represents a good, good brightness uh, discrimination. And on the other side, when there is a large value I see upon my eye, that means a large percentage change. That is not good for the brightness. That is not good for the Weber ratio. This is denoted by the I plus delta I. Then this is a range. We can say this is the float where the brightness will be increased and the mm, or we can say Weber ratio will be used as the intensity or as a function of the intensity. And the plot of the log delta I C divided by delta I as a function of the log I as a general shape that is shown. And this course shows that brightness discrimination is poor at low levels of the illumination and it improves significantly as background illumination increases. So whenever there's an improvement in the, uh, whenever there's a background illumination increases that improves significantly and there are two branches that is reflected in the curve that is reflect that at a low level of the illumination vision is carried out by the roads but the high level is the function of the cones. In this there are again the two phenomenon that is used that denote that illustrates the brightness that is not a simple function of the intensity. There are two parts. One is a simultaneous contrast that is related to the fact that a person perceived the brightness that depends on the intensity. This is the actual intensity that is, that is represented within the square. One is a zigzag that is an analog method that is also the intensity. This is the well-known optical illusions. Now next one is the electromagnetic spectrum. Now let's talk about the light and the electromagnetic spectrum that is introduced in uh, section 1.3 also. Yeah, that, that same example that we are taken about the prism when the sunlight is passed in section 1.3. So that, that discovery will be found by the Newton that discovered that when a beam of the sunlight is passed through a glass prism, the emerging beam of the light is not white but it consists instead of a continuous spectrum of the color. That means, for example, when you talk about the rainbow in the sky, there are multiple colors. There are seven colors in that rainbow. But if I talk about the sun rays, that is only the white or the yellow. 
in the same way when the sunlight is passed to a glass prism the emerging beam of the light is not wide but consists instead of the continuous spectrum of the colors that ranging from a violet at one end to red at the other end so what whatever the range of color that we perceive in the visible light that represents a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum so how, how it will be achieved that is achieved by using the electromagnetic spectrum on one end of the spectrum, the radio waves or the radio waves with the wavelength billions of the times longer than those of visible light. That means the radio waves with the wavelength that, is, that contains the billions of the times uh, longer than the other field that is used with the uh, visible light. And on the other end of the spectrum are the gamma rays. So one is a wavelength billions of the time, one is a gamma rays with wavelengths millions of the times that is smaller than the visible light. The electromagnetic spectrum can be expressed in terms of the wavelength, frequency or the energy. That can be expressed in terms of wavelength, in terms of the frequency or in terms of the energy. Wavelength and the frequency are related by the expression. This is the expression that is used for the wavelength and the frequency. And this is the example of the this is the example of the electron or electron volts that is available that is used with the uh, 1 then 10 key power 10 power 1 until 10 power 6 in the same way there's a negative side that is increased 10 power minus 1 till 10 power minus 9 because this is the energy of the one photon in the same way there is a frequency that is available in the hertz that ranging from the 10 power 5 to the 10 power 21 then there's a wavelength that is available in the meters that that ranging from the 10 yeah, 1 and then on the left hand side, there is a 10, 10 power minus 1 till 10 power minus 2 on the right hand side, 10 power minus 1 till 10 power minus or 10 power 1 and 3. And this is the gamma rays or gamma X-ray ultraviolet, infrared, microwave and the radio wave. And when you talk about the visible spectrum that contains a multiple uh, colors, we can say ultraviolet, violet. Then a blue, green, yellow, orange, red, and infrared. That is the electromagnetic spectrum. The visible spectrum is shown zoom to facilitate whatever the facilitate uh, expressions or uh, explanations. But more than the visible spectrum is a rather uh, narrow portion of the uh, narrow portion of the EM spectrum. Where the C is the speed of the light, that is 2.998 into 10 power 8. And the energy of the various components of the electromagnetic spectrum is given by the expression that is E equals to HV. Where the H is a constant term and the unit of the wavelength are the, in the meters. While the while with the terms micron that is denoted with the ohm, that is 10 power minus 6 and the nanometer that is noted with the 10 power minus 9 that is used as a frequency or that is used most frequently we can say and the frequency is measured in the hertz with one hertz being equals to the one cycle that is that is used or one cycle that is used for the for the wavelength with one hertz being equals to the one cycle of the Wave, waves per second and the commonly used unit of the energy is the electron volt. Electromagnetic waves can also be visualized as propagating the waves with the wavelength or can be thought of as, as of the stream of the massless particle that travels in a wave, wave-like pattern and moving at a speed of the light. And each massless particle contains a certain amount of the energy. The particles may be a tiny particle, that particle may be a blender particle or bundle particles. This is the graphical representation of the one wavelength. This is this is available within the zigzag, that is an analog representation. And that bundle of energy is known as the photon. That is used to carry the high frequency, that is the shorter frequency or shorter wavelength electromagnetic phenomenon that carries a more energy per photon. Therefore, radio waves have protons or have photons with low energies. Microwave have higher energy than the radio waves. Infrared still more and then visible ultraviolet rays. This is the main reason why ultraviolet rays are available with the X-rays. And finally, gamma rays are the most energetic of all. So, when we compare the multiple rays or multiple waves, so when we talk about the gamma rays, that is a more energetic at all. And this is the reason why gamma rays are so dangerous to the living organisms. Why, why we say that the rays are not 
or rage can uh, rage can uh, damage your life and light is a particular type of the electromagnetic ra- radiation that can be sensed that can be felt by the human eye and the visible color spectrum that is expanded that is available within the figure 2.10 that we have discussed for the purpose of the uh, color mechanism that we are going to discuss in chapter number 6 Now, if I'm talking about the range of the electromagnetic spectrum, that range from the 0.43 ohm, that is violet to the 0.79 ohm. So this ranges from the violet to the red color. And for more convenience, the color spectrum is divided into six broad regions, six broad categories. We can say violet, blue, green, orange, and red. No, no color ends in that way, but rather than uh, each range blends smoothly into the next one. and whatever the color that the human perceives in an object are determined by the nature of the light reflected from the object so whatever the light that when passed to the object that was reflected from the object a body that reflects light relatively balanced in all visible wavelength that appears white to the observer however a body that flavors or that favors the reflections in the limited range of the visible spectrum that also exhibits some shades of the color or there are some shades of the colors for example green objects reflect light with wavelength in the 500 to 570 nm range when absorbing most of the energy at the other wavelength and the light that is void of color that means there is no color that is known as a monochromatic light the main attribute only attribute is the intensity of, so how how we feel if the if the there is no color of the light that is filled by only one of the attribute that is a monochromatic light that is a uh, intensity or the amount and the chromatic light spans electromagnetic energy spectrum from this this is the range from 0.43 to 0.79 in principle if a sensor can be developed is that is capable of detecting the energy that is radiated by a band of its electromagnetic spectrum so we can image the events we can we can judge the events of the interest in that band and it is important to note that however that at the wavelength of an electromagnetic wave required to see an object that must be of the same size or the smaller than the object so it depends on the wavelength or to wavelength that the electromagnetic waves that is required to see an object that must be of the same size or smaller than the object therefore to study the molecules we would need a source capable of emitting in the far ultraviolet or soft x ray region this limitation along with the physical properties of the sensor material establish the fundamental limits on the capability of imaging sensors such as a visible infrared or other sensors in the day to day life in the use today that is used in the day to day life that is used for the measurement that imaging is one of the radiated measurement energy that is radiated by the electromagnetic waves that is only method for the image generation and there is a sound that reflected from objects that can be used to form the electrosonic images so whatever the image whatever the object that will be formed that will be formed for the electrosonic images and other other major sources of the imaging or the digital images are the electronic beam for electron microscopy and the synthetic images that is used in the graphics and the visualizations and there are the two forms of energy one is a lower energy that is known as a soft end of the x ray band that is available with one uh, x ray band and one is a hard x ray that are used in the industrial application one is a soft x ray and that is used for the human beings like any fracture in the body that is also judged by the x rays and if i am talking about the hard x rays or the hard energy that are used in the industrial application and the chest and the dental x rays are in the category of the 
lower end or the low energy end that is the soft of the x-rays and the soft x-ray band transitions into the far ultraviolet light region which in turn blends with the visible spectrum at a longer wavelength that is near the infrared region and the opposite end is known as the far infrared region so one of, there are two parts one is a near infrared region one is a far infrared region and this, this energy will be opened, will be moved in the microwave band. And this band is well known source as the source of the energy in the microwave ovens. That is also available, that is the microwave ovens that has more uses, including the communication and the radar. And finally, the radio waves band encompasses the television as AM and the FM. Now, tell me the full form of the AM and the FM. Yeah, very good. One is ampli amplifier magnitude or mo modulation, one is a frequency modulation. Amplifier modulation, or amplified modulation and the frequency modulations. Now next one is the image sensing and acquisition that I'm going to take in the next class, that in the tomorrow's class. That is, what are the various image sensing, how we can sense the image, how and what are the various acquisition method that is used for the image sensing. So any doubts, anyone in the today's class, so, if there is any doubts, you can ask the doubts. What about the image creation? How? What are the various difference between the low, low image, large image, less image? Any, any doubts, anyone regarding the assignment? Anything? So next topic. Yeah, you have. Just do one thing. Read out for five minutes. 